Blue, uh, Back for Burrell. Um, my play is Crosses. And I feel like my story is so much more cheesy. Um, <laughs> more cheesy than <laughs> magic? <laughs> <laughs> because I, I feel like when I finally like was like, all right, yeah. I was in college, uh, I majored in psych, and I literally went to my psych uh, uh, admi advisor and was like, so how do I concentrate in theater? <laughs> and, um, and that was because I saw like a peer prevention troupe performing. I was like, yeah. Oh, wow. I'm nice. going gonna, gonna to do that. Oh, and then wow. I did that and was like, we're going to like minor in theater now. Those, <laughs> yeah. those shows hit hard. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I really, really love that. That's beautiful. I just directed the University of Minnesota's like peer prevention orientation play. So maybe we're going to find some theater kids, some future blues. <laughs> Clarence. Uh, hi, I'm Clarence Koo. I wrote Chapters of a Floating Life, uh, he, him. Um, and I guess the moment I knew I wanted to do theater was it was also a show. Um, it was not the touring production of Wicked. It was actually a community theater production of Big River. Oh. in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and I, I mean, for high school, me, I was like, wow, this is like so cool. Um, in, in terms of like the stagecraft and the music and um, um, the magic that, that, that happened on stage. Um, and, and the fact that it went through um, so many different locations on the same place and we had to use our imagination. Um, and it's funny because now that I think about it, it was a road trip play, which is funny mm -hmm. because now I'm thinking oh. about Charlie's play, which is also a road trip play. I love that. Amazing play. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the magic of theater. Yes. <laughs> Noah. Hi, I'm Noah Gardner. I'm um, he, him. Um, and um, when did I want to do theater? Um, I guess, I, well, I did a speech and debate in high school, and I was on the speech side. So, like, interpretation, you got to work with scripts and perform it for an audience in a 10-minute piece, and you had to try and get them to care in 10 minutes and get them to, you know? And so um, I saw that and I was like, I didn't want to act. I, I figured out I, I wanted to make that piece of writing that could help, you know, um, move somebody, you know, in, in that little high school classroom. And um, at, when I went to undergrad, we, I took a survey where, I mean, the class was, this is an amazing class, which is like, we go around LA, I went to Loyola Marymount and, um, we would just go see theater. So every week we saw something different every mm -hmm. week. So we saw Black Box, we saw Devised, we saw musicals, we saw, and, and um, some of the best things I've, I've seen are, were at Atwater yeah. Village Theater. Mm. So mm -hmm. I love that, I love that place. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, our team from Dr. Silver, uh, uh, Nick had to fly back to Canada today for production, uh, and it is Britta Johnson's birthday. And so her and her sister and half the cast of Dr. Silver are currently at Disneyland. Um, <laughs> And uh, Eleanor, of course, is preparing for tech to go into our next show. So I want to thank you all for being here and sharing those memories and those moments. I'll offer up that the first moment I knew I wanted to do theater, I was in New York with a performing arts troupe, and I watched the Classical Theater of Harlem uh, uh, do a production of The Cherry Orchard mm. with Wendell Pierce. And that man said, oh, my mm. God, my <laughs> God, The Cherry Orchard is mine. Mm. The play, and I said, ooh, hoo, hoo, there's something going on here. Ah. I like it. I wanted us to start with these moments that we knew because I wanted to sort of, uh, my first question to you is sort of about a theme that I feel like I've noticed picking up throughout PPF. It's nothing that we planned, but we've been touching on memory and remembering. In chapters, some people write in order to remember. We got the writing of memories and experience into story and novel. Crosses, you don't want to remember. One uh, character says to another, children and adults hunted by their past. Coleman, you are remembering the bad. I am remembering it all. All, a group of siblings piecing together their memory. And Avaz, Roya is overtaken by her memories. Uh, and I actually really love the plea of connection in you don't remember graduation, this beautiful moment there. Galilee, you'll see, I remember. Now you'll be listening for it. In Galilee, I remember is a group of um, people trying to uh, piece together uh, the memories of a man they loved beyond belief. And Dr. Silver, a new line that we heard, it wasn't even in the script. I had to get Nick to send it to me. He says this thing about memories anchor us to reality. We got these memories. We got this remembering. In the staircase, I honestly didn't remember it until you just told me just now how a mother is losing her memories. Why? 
How is memory impacting your work? Why does it matter? What are you thinking about when you start writing and talking about what we remember? Hmm. I mean, I think we can all go home now. I mean, <laughs> I mean, like, That's what I do. <laughs> now you. <laughs> memory. Stump them, my favorite version. All alone in the moonlight. <laughs> that, this is the only room where that will land. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hmm. I mean, I guess uh, th this is just a, I'm just, this is purely theoretical, but I don't know, because I don't know when you wrote your plays, but I think that, so I wrote Coleman the f April 2020, so you know, first months of the pandemic. And so there wasn't, I wonder, if, I wonder if there was something about doing a play that is deeply about looking back and kind of the, and trying to make really active the process of looking back because I was super sedentary. I wonder if just we're in this life cycle right now where we've all, where these plays all kind of came out from that. I don't know, that's maybe just me. That's just a theory. We'll take it. Um, no, I, this, this actually, <laughs> this, I don't remember when I started this, I just know that it's the play that's taken the longest to come to, you know, mm -hmm. give birth to, so it's mm -hmm. been years I've been working on it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that memory is such an interesting thing because you can't trust it, but you also need it to work through the things that you are carrying. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, that was really important when I was working on Crosses is like, if you have trauma and pain, mm -hmm. in order to, to move through it, in order to face it, you actually have to sit with the memories that you mm -hmm. don't want to remember. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's interesting because um, also not knowing all the things, I'm like, I feel like that probably speaks to all the things you were, you were talking about. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's, a great, it's a great device anyways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Come on, just the <laughs> technique of it. Anybody else on memory? Uh, it, it, does, it does make me think about why I'm attracted to theater as opposed to other art forms and mm -hmm. why I write for the theater. Um, because th theater is something that we work so hard on, you know, like um, playwrights writing and then rehearsal and then the production and then the designers uh, and then the audience comes and sees it and then it's over. Like there's the run and then it's gone and then it just like lives in people's memories. Yeah. And um, as theater people, we... Um, embrace that in a way you know mm -hmm. that like people who write novels they have their book and people who do film they have you, you know the film that you could people generations and generations in the future can watch um and i i guess we're just we have a trust i guess in in the present experience and enjoying it and being in it and then just like letting go and letting it be mm -hmm. the memory mm -hmm. that doesn't really answer your question but it's more like a reflection oh it memory. answered it okay. it was it's down <laughs> Noah, Michael, any offers? Yeah, like theater is so ephemeral. Like a memory is like it's there, mm -hmm. and then it's not recorded. You'll never see it again, and and then you just take it with you. Mm -hmm. And memory comes down to interpretation because we're we're all not gonna remember mm -hmm. the same thing the same way. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, of Michael, you know, when your mom came, I'm like, I'm wondering what you know. You play your mom, and I wonder what that car ride is home. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I didn't say that. <laughs> yes, you did. Or, you know what I mean? They just it was the same event, but maybe yeah. you two interpreted it. A different a different way and my professor used to say like theater is a seance and you can bring back people and you get to say something mm -hmm. to them mm -hmm. that maybe you you couldn't say in real life and that's your own thing that's your own memory that you get to have of them that I never had this person in my life in real life but I get to have them here in this mm -hmm. place mm. yeah I mean I well I'll talk about the car ride I mean, <laughs> my mother has notes. <laughs> no, she's like, mm, 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 that was not. Mm, mm. I'm like, girl, I, this is my play. Okay. <laughs> but um, what's amazing about it is like, well, or, or you know, what, what's interesting about it is that I'm, it's, this is a play that I'm writing. I'm, I am embodying her story mm -hmm. and I'm putting her story into my body and sort of taking on her history and my family's history and our and, and that long sort of tradition. Mm. Um, but also, it's, my, it's, through, it's th ultimately through my lens, you know what I mean? It's through, um, it's the way I process those events. And so like people will see the play and they'll be like, well how much of this actually happened? Right. Even though I'm telling mm. my mother's story, I'm still interpreting it through, w through my eyes. Mm. 
And there's a scene in the play um, that takes place in an underground party um, where uh, my mother, the character of my mother, is has a very intimate moment with uh, with another woman, and it's sort of it's it's open to interpretation, and it's there's this deep intimacy. And my mother was like, "That's not how it is." I'm like, <laughs> it, but for me, it was like I see the way Iranian women mm-hmm. um, are so intimate with each other as just just as friends as. Uh, you know, at parties, right? Like the festivity of a, of an Iranian party, it, it's it's intimate with everyone, not just women, but also um, also men. What's happening right now in Iran? There is this deep intimacy between people that are out on the streets, and there it's just like all uh, they're all joined together in this cause of of woman life freedom. Um, you know, it's like we we are in this together, and we're not giving up the fight. And so I wanted to sort of bring that intimacy into the play and sort of uh, just pay homage to it and, and honor it. Um, yeah. Michael, you just opened your show and you not only perform as your mother, you of course wrote the uh, play as well. What's that process been like, being a writer and a performer? Mm. How has one changed or altered the other? Mm. Well, it's been, uh, it's been quite intense and fabulous. I mean, I will say, you know, I had... I, I mentioned like I was doing magic, and so I was on stage for a lot of my life. Um, this is the first time I'm actually in a play of my own. You know, um, I have another play <laughs> that I'm that I'm writing at the Geffen, which is uh, a magic play. So that's a whole other conversation. Mm-hmm. But um, but this is, and, and I'm in that as well. But this is like, this was the first. This I wrote, started writing this a couple years ago, and. I mean, it's, you know, it's beyond, it's just like, it's so meaningful because I get to, I really get, I feel like I get to call my ancestors into the room, mm. into this, into this sanctuary. Like, it really feels like being up here with 500 seats in the theater, mm. it feels like a sanctuary. Mm-hmm. And like, you know, we have Iranian women coming to the show, Iranian people coming to the show, mm. many of whom have never stepped foot inside a theater. Mm. You know, I, people will come and tell me. I, many of my family members, they don't go see plays. Because, I mean, you know, fabulous, but are they gonna see like a Christmas carol? I mean, <laughs> lovely, but like my 83 year old grandmother, it's not speaking to her in the same way. And, mm-hmm. and so it's, it's really just an honor. It's like, and, and also the, the last thing I'll say is like, they come and they'll say, you know, this part of your, this part of your story is also my story, yeah. you know? And that's like amazing for these women, mm-hmm. for especially for, especially for Iranian women who come and come to me, I'm like, it's so beautiful. Zora Neale Hurston says, tell a story, get a story in return. And there's always something really powerful about that. It shapes so much of the way I think about theater is how we tell a story and we get one back. It's why we love panels. It's why I actually love post-show conversations because mm-hmm. people just start nodding. They're like, wow. I'm like, you are moved by someone else's mm-hmm. story. There's something really special in there. Noah, you weren't in your play, but you were in your play as we were doing the readings, right? My favorite story was uh, last night at the Bash. Somebody came up to me, they're like, like, oh man, I really love that staircase and the percussionist. I th- he just was so good and so focused. I said, well, you know, he's also the playwright. What? Uh, so I'm just so curious, the music, the, the music, the instrument, the chanting, mm-hmm. integral to the staircase, mm-hmm. why? You know, that, that drum, it's, it's called an ipuheke, and it's a very, it's an old instrument in that like this is the same sound you would have heard 2000 years ago come on you know what i mean it's it's just they grew it's two gourds and they grow at a certain it's oblong and then there's like a head shape and it's it's put together and it makes this sound that's not like a timpani it's not a snare you know it's it's what what we call kahiko it's just old it's old world and so that's yeah. kind of where i want to build all of my plays from is um how to honor that side and being in the in the play is like the rarest thing for me because I'm not I, don't, I never want to be a one man show I I, I, don't, I couldn't do it but it was an honor to be on stage to support the the cast that was already there so it's not like oh go do it and I'll watch it was like, I'm right there with you I'm mm-hmm. warming up with you I'm, you know we're doing all the things and. Um, I was comfortable only in that like I was third chair trumpet in band, so I had a music stand, <laughs> I had an instrument, the, con- you know, the, the conductor, the director says go, I go, but I had to just think about uh, staying neutral on stage because mm. 
in, in that first night, I was kind of like, you know, taking notes and like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. things are going. But then my trainer said, you need to relax, enjoy it. So, cause I didn't watch it the first night. I was just like so. Ooh. But then this, the next night I watched and I enjoyed, mm-hmm. and um, people said, oh, that that my, mm. <laughs> that helped. That, so they <laughs> they got to enjoy the piece when I enjoyed the piece. Yeah. But it's very rare to have the playwright. It's weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that you were there. Uh, we got music. Uh, Clarence, uh, your characters, I mean, you, you, your characters are talking about language, and you got a writer writing about the process of writing, and you yourself are a writer. I'm just curious what drew you to writing about language and telling the story of Chapters of a Floating Life? Oh, um, gosh. Um, about, I guess to tackle the idea about writing, um, I guess I'm just fascinated by some people feel like they need to write, like us. <laughs> and then other people, like people in my family who don't. And, um, and they lead happy lives. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I think for me, part of this play was trying to figure out, like, why do we, so funny. Why do we who need to write need to write? Um, and, 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 and how do people who don't write look at us? And how do we who write look at people who don't write? Um, and again, I respect people who don't write. You guys are living happy lives, um, <laughs> and, and and so that's why I think in that play there are people who are really into like language and like nerdy intellectual stuff, and people who are more practical. I love that. I love that. Um, Blue, you uh, tackle a really uh, heavy uh, tack, um, a topic in Crossus, and the ending takes my breath away every single time. I've uh, read it three times, seen it twice now, and it's sort of, it really, I mean, you've in many ways, particularly in the reading we got to see with Lillian Brown, a ritual of a sort comes forward to sort of bring this um, sort of story forward. Why? Why'd you feel like you needed to write that uh, story? Why'd you feel like you needed to get that out? And it's been the longest thing you've worked on, you said. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that. Um, well, it comes from uh, a cultural place. It comes from um, living and being around secrets. Mm. Um, and and having to piece things together mm-hmm. to to see a full picture, and um, I I really um, just kind of heard these these characters, these kids in my head mm-hmm. at some point where I was like, oh, that's you know that's my family's land, and these are aunts and uncles I don't actually know because they're not with us anymore Mm -hmm. but being around these little bits and pieces and crumbs all my life and no one wanting to like talk about it yeah um and talk about something that is not just affecting the family but the country as a whole um I kind of I just wanted to honor that in a very real way Mm -hmm. um that can, you know, land and sit with us. Because like you said, it's very heavy and it's very daunting to get into that play. I tell you, every time I go like work on it, I'm like. (laughs) 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 Um, And so, yeah, it really, it it comes from like wanting to take care of my people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The body remembers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even the body remembers, even if we don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And there's just something really beautiful about that ritual of release, you know, and to say the thing and to get the thing out and then sending that young girl on. I just, I'll never, it'll, it'll always be stuck. The image of hands on the back, hands on the back. Charlie, you and I have talked about Coleman 72 and multiple, Charlie's been, Charlie's been here, so we've been doing uh, lots of uh, uh, Q and A's. Mm-hmm. But one thing I haven't told you about uh, the play that I really love in Coleman 72 is uh, the dad basically is like, listen, you can't be no cheerleader. You can't be doing this art stuff. Mm-hmm. You need to be a doctor. Everybody's like, oh, that's so. And then some, but your father says a thing that has stuck with me and I will never forget. He said, you got to be, you got to have a job that, uh, that so the world won't throw you away. Mm. Yeah. And I have never, the idea of like, I just want you to be secure in the world Mm -hmm. so that they cannot toss you away. And the only position is that of healer. So they're like, and I'm just curious, where did that come from? What are you, what are you thinking? What are you processing there? I mean, that's 
specifically, um, that sentiment was is a is really a frankly a direct pull from my grandfather. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, there you know, and that that was passed down. I didn't hear directly from him, but you know, was was passed down to my father, and my father told me about you know how th this kind of philosophy. You know, my grandfather was. Um, grew up in, in, in two wars, you know, and, uh, and came to America right after the Korean War. And he, he had this belief that, you know, when, if you are a doctor, that is, you know, when societal disruption happens, when there is war, when there is relocations, when you are a refugee, like the, if you can, a, like a human life is always priceless. Mm. And so if you can be a doctor, that means that you will never be someone who is sent to the front you know you'll mm. that means that you're you'll never be somebody huh. who is um disposable yeah. and you know i th there's there's a logic to that you know yeah. and it's and it, it's, it's a logic of survival it, it's mm -hmm. the logic of survival and um and so i think that a lot of working on coleman 72 has been an empathetic like a, an empathetic exercise and trying to understand these people that I'm related to but you know my grandfather died when I was in high school I didn't get to really know as a um, as an as an adult and um, just last night there were I, I was at, at our at the PPF bash there was I was talking to a couple people who saw the play that night who um, uh, born and raised in in Korea, and and one actually still lives in Korea, and one lives in Los Angeles, and we were and we were they were commenting on. I thought it was really interesting about how they thought that the that Coleman could have only be written could only have been written by a third generation kid, mm. because because <laughs> first and second generations too mm. they're, they're, we're too close to it. Mm. You know, we mm. are like you have that they they, they felt that kind of translation and perspective and kind of dis the distance of that mm. perspective um which was interesting to hear i hadn't thought yeah. about it in that way before i love that what our elders give us to help us sort of make it through my father was born in 1946 uh and so uh, it always uh, sort of blows my mind i grew up in detroit surrounded by blackness and then i moved to minnesota um uh, but it, it, but it's interesting because i tell you like they talk about detroit hustle but my father always sort of like I ask people like, what um, what's uh, a piece of advice that you've been given? This is the question to you. What's a piece of advice that you've been given that shapes you? And often, like my father, sort of, I do a lot of work around anti-racism, equity, diversity, inclusion, and um, you know, I'll just say it boldly: uh, 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 white people don't scare me uh, in the same way that they, in, in the same way that they scare or sort of create a lot of tension in ways. Um, mostly, that's because I was born and raised in Detroit, surrounded by blackness. Uh, and then my father also sort of just told me, he like, they just don't know no better and so the way my father sort of lives in my brain and my dad basically told me that you know they can't get it together and don't expect much of them and it's made my job easier and uh there are some white folks who have got it together and thank you for that i'm just naming though that like that piece of advice is part of the reason why i'm really good at what i do is that my dad like in 19 since 1946 is like nah uh and that's been really helpful for me uh it may not be something like that but what's a piece of advice you've been given uh, by someone that's really sort of shaped you as a writer or as a person? I told them they would be stumped and they have permission to sit in silence. No need to rush. You know, I do, um, I help out with um, traditional tattooing, traditional Hawaiian tattooing, and um, the, um, he's a sua suluape, and um, that just means he's, um, he's a master at what he does. And um, he told me that, um, you know, d just pursue the cultural and the rest will take care of itself. Mm. And so I think what he meant really was like, you know, you can go for this job for the money, you can go this, for this job for the whatever, but if it's not serving culturally, mm. then it's not gonna benefit you in the long run. And that's what he did, that he was, he was able to build out his life just by pursuing um, you know, all of his knowledge that he has was literally sitting at the foot of other old old folks yeah. and just taking that in. And, you know, they he, he wants for nothing at this point because he he's just, 
he just mm -hmm. he just gets to do what he does and it serves the community mm -hmm. and so I, I i do it this i feel the same way now where i don't do i don't do theater in hawaii there's not a big scene so i do i'm in education i work at a hawaiian language school just as a tutor it's a it, full immersion that means it's, mm -hmm. it's conducted in hawaiian the kids all speak hawaiian um Mm. And I also, I also go to the university. I went back for a second undergraduate degree in Hawaiian language and Hawaiian mm. studies. And I felt compelled to do that after mm. graduate school because I went to USC and I was, you know, the only native Hawaiian in the room and I had nothing to say mm. about it. And I felt like a, mm. a, a this deep deficit to be mm. um, on the Aina A, to be on the mainland and um, have, have no authority on what I'm even writing about. Mm. So I was, and my professors asked me, are, are you gonna keep writing after you graduate? And I said, no, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna pursue culture. And mm. it just so happens that I'm, I'm able to do both. And so that to me means that his advice is, is meaningful and works, you know. Mm. Pursue the culture. Yeah. Mm. I was trying to think of something <laughs> from my family and I couldn't um, instead what came through what popped into my head is from the bestie shout out to bestie Abby um, which is um, living authentically mm. and 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 being unapologetic about that and coming to the work in the same in the same way so <laughs> um, like there'd be times when I'll have conversations about oh you know uh, Am I, am I honoring my people? Which, whether that means Jamaicans, Caribbeans, black people, black women, the diaspora. Um, and, and I'm like, is this something that I should put in front of other people? I do not, like, is it problematic? Should I, like, and she'll be like, well, does that person exist? And mm -hmm. I'm like, you damn right they exist, all right. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and um, if you move in the world that way, there's less space for fraudulence and dissonance. Mm -hmm. And so that is the thing that I try to do in my life, and that is the thing I try to do in my work with my characters, is move in the same way. Come mm. on. Okay, so that was beautiful, both of you. I mean, what, what it brought up for me is expect miracles. Expect Aww. miracles. And you know, I've heard that a miracle is a shift in perception from fear to love. And I love what you said, Noah, about service. Because I feel like that is theater, you know, mm -hmm. to, to be creating a collective experience where people can get together and, exp you know, in a visceral bodily way, mm -hmm. feel their feelings, you know, feel the celebration, feel the joy, um, and to follow that. You know, for me, like, expecting miracles, you know, I started working on this play a couple years ago, right before, we had um, Maritz von Stupnagel, who's, who's directing the play, an absolutely brilliant collaborator. Mm -hmm. We've been working on it for a few years, and we did a reading right before the pandemic. Um, and we were at La Mama, and then, and then everything shut down, obviously. And then, um, and then I did PPF, like right when it, I guess last year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's sort of, we, we're, we've been on such an insane journey with it, which I could not have anticipated, or I could not have explained to you how that was going to unfold. But we went to Ojai Playwrights Conference. We were invited to Sundance Institute, you know, um, Theater Aspen, all over the place. And, like, you know, that wasn't necessarily, you know, yes, like we are showing up and doing our part, right? We're doing our part. But there are also other forces at work, whether you want to call it nature or whatever you want to say is at work, you know, whatever that, whatever that means to you. Um, but it's like, it, it does feel miraculous to be doing this play right now as there's a movement happening in Iran right now, mm -hmm. like literally right now. And this, you know, SCR programmed the show sort of before that was really part of the dialogue. And, um, you know, this is, I, I'm actually told this is the first major production of an Iranian play ever in Southern California, mm -hmm. uh, which is crazy. This is the biggest home to Iranians outside of Iran. Mm -hmm. And so... Like, that is definitely not my doing. You know what I mean? Like, I could not have said, let's do this play now when, the, like, but that the stars sort of aligned. Mm -hmm. And I think it's partly because, you know, like, I didn't, I didn't set out to write a play about, like, what's going on in the moment, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. three or four years ago. Yeah. I just set out to write a play. I mean, I didn't even really set out. I just sort of, like, mm -hmm. listened to this character that was in my head, like you said before. <laughs> 
and it was like mm. my mother telling her story, and then the miracles happen. Mm. So I, you know, I Expect really have come to believe in miracles. Come you know, on. Expect miracles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And like again, and then the last thing I'll say is like it's not a. It's not like a woo-woo thing. Mm. It's actually like kind of guaranteed. You know what I mean? Like if you show up and do your part and you, you know, are there doing serve, being of service, mm. whatever it is, um, you know, like you, I, I lo also love what you said, Blue. Um, the rest sort of unfolds. It's, it's attractive. You know what I mean? It's mm. literally attracting opportunities, people, mm. Mm -hmm. um, and the people that might need to be there in that moment. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like. I don't know who's gonna be. In, we, I was just having a conversation yesterday, like, who's gonna be in that theater that needs to hear this play? Maybe mm. there's one person. I don't know, mm. but that's not up to me to decide who's gonna be in the theater. All I need to do is show up and do my part, and the rest is miraculous mm. in my experience. Mm -hmm. Clarence, Noah, any advice? Um, you know, it, it's funny. I'm, I'm just gonna say the person who gave me really good advice was Michael, uh, because <laughs> because ten ten minutes ago I, we were just catching up, and um, I, I was telling him that I left my job, my full, my day job. Um, I was an administrator at a university for 11 years, uh, and I left it last year. Um, and so I'm just like living off some savings and not knowing what my future will bring. And that was his advice: expect miracles. Um, I love it. <laughs> uh, We're on message, baby. We'll <laughs> take it. We will take it. So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm taking it. I'm, I'm holding on to that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. No, no, uh, um, Clarence, Cl Charlie. <laughs> Third time's a charm. Right. Um, fail. Um, I'm still thinking about Expect Miracle. I think that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and that made, made me think of, I had a teacher in high school. I had, a, I had a drama teacher in high school who would tell us, live your life as a work of art. Mm -hmm. and, I th and I think that that mm -hmm. really struck me, which is that you can... That yes, we can all write a play, we can create art, but there's just a fundamental way of engaging in the world with curiosity, with grace, with empathy, with a sense of play um, that is an art form in and of itself. Yeah. And um, I, that that idea has always, I mean, has stuck with me for years um and you know it's not it's not always easy to li live that you know it's, mm. it's easy to get caught up in the doldrums and the in the and kind of a reactive fear to ever to the world to mm -hmm. to you know the kind of ups and downs of the the business that comes mm -hmm. with art and every, but but there's but to like to live your life as a piece of art and to kind of have that type of engagement with a creative relationship with yourself, you know, kind of throughout, is um, has been really a meaningful piece of advice that George George Keating, uh, Chicago actor director, gave me. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, speaking of curiosity, we're going to invite your curiosity. We're going to open it up to the audience for questions. A few things you need to know, whether in a panel or a post-show conversation, I always offer up this idea. <coughs> These are opportunities for you to sort of uh, have the courage to embrace your curiosity, which means you get to ask any questions or any ideas or thoughts that you want. It does not mean that your thoughts or questions will be answered or that they will not be met with challenge. Your curiosity <laughs> is welcome, but you might find yourself being challenged in your curiosity. I may say, oh no, we won't answer that question. Or I may push back against your question. None of the people up here have to answer your question. They will if they so feel moved to answer your question. Now that I've scared you enough, <laughs> By making boundaries clear, mm. I open up and encourage your curiosity. Please raise your hand and I'll call on you. There's always a dramatic pause once I open up for questions. That's normal, except my good friend in the back <laughs> came through for me and that's what I'm talking about. What's your question? I'll repeat it. Yes. Sometimes I'll take a question and direct it. I'm going to toss this one to Noah first because it was untitled. 
then it was a small man, right. and now it is indeed the staircase. This is my, my own personal thing, but like, um, the title is How You Meet the Play, so it is important. And I always felt like um, the, the title should be the metaphor of the play. I mean, it doesn't always have to be, but it, it's, it's there so that when you get to that point where it's uncovered, you know, I, was, I, I watched like The Glass Menagerie for the first time, and it was on the car ride home, I was like, oh, <laughs> it's a metaphor because she's like, and, th and then I was like, it all <laughs> kind of came together. And so you, I, I, you don't want to have a play that, I mean, a title that kind of uh, misdirects mm -hmm. either, and you don't want it to be obvious uh, about why it is that thing. You don't want that thing to appear on the first page, or I don't know. It, it, but it is, it for me, it has to be the metaphor. So my title changed because the metaphor in process changed. Mm. Excellent. Anybody else on your title? Maybe one more. say the same thing like <laughs> one of my things is like we need to make this short um, <laughs> I remember um, like the first full length play I uh, had like a placeholder title and it was like the Lorraine Hanbury School of Law it was so long Come on. it was just like girl you are doing too much there is a way <laughs> there is a way to capture this uh, to capture the essence of the play in a very quick way for people to remember and to like when they watch you're like oh Oh, I get it. PS 365. There's a double meaning here. It's a school, but also this happens every all day, every day. Mm. Uh, crosses, like you'll discover you don't know what it means because if you're not Jamaican, but as you watch the play, you sure as hell will find out. You come like, on, ah, I get it. <laughs> um, so like my, I'm I'm very much like, what's the shortest, quickest way to have an aha moment as you watch mm. the play? Excellent. Gonna all open up for more questions. We'll answer a few. We won't hear from everybody as we go because we got a little bit of time coming to you. Oh. Yes, I have a question about your creative process. I just wanted to ask, uh, from the genesis to where it's at right now in the development of your pieces, uh, what has the stages been like? Because, you know, I, I mean, <coughs> obviously we're seeing one stage of it, mm. the life of it. What has been the journey of your pieces? Mm. Uh, some of you have mentioned, you know, it's been a couple of years. Mm. At which point mm. has there been attraction to move it forward? Questions about the journey of your uh, uh, pieces there. Clarence, could we start with you? Yeah, um, I've been working on this play for maybe about four years now. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's alternating between like writing by yourself and then working with actors. Because it, I, I think a play is really like, like writing music. You know, you really have to hear it um, to, to understand it. Um, and it's only once you have actors um, that you're that you know that oh I've I've written too much <laughs> so, so I should maybe cut back on some of the words um, or something still aren't clear so I'll um, move you know this this phrase here or there um, so so yes yeah, so so for me it's just alternating between being by myself working with actors coming back working by myself uh, and then working with actors again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's right, Clarence. And I think also, like, you know, this is why development is so important and being able to have opportunities like PPF and, mm -hmm. um, and, the, and conferences and all of this, like, mm -hmm. it's, it's critical. And we've been, you know, I mentioned mm -hmm. we've been doing Avaz. Um, we had a number of different touch points. You know, we had a longer rehearsal process because Moritz is, first of all, this guy's, like, doing, like, 10 shows at once. You know what I mean? Like, he was doing a show at the Geffen. So we were rehearsing in LA while we were while he was at the Geffen. After this, he's going back to Broadway with Danny DeVito and uh, Lucy DeVito. And so like we're like in the in the sort of middle of this conversation. We had learned a lot about the play working up to this point, um, but then it was really when we started getting into um, the production that it's like okay, so now we need to think about blocking and, and movement and how does the character actually. Um, move and how do we in interact with the audience and how do we think about this um, in a dynamic way so that's that's been a, another point of unfolding and it will continue to unfold like you know we're actually taking the play on tour 
Um, there will be a national tour that happens after uh, after this in the next year exciting. plus, which is exciting. We're setting that up now. And, um, you know, like Luis Alfaro, who's a brilliant, br brilliant playwright, you know, family member of, of SCR, um, and a literal genius, mm -hmm. by the way. I really mm -hmm. like him. An actual genius. Mm -hmm. um, like, he'll, he'll have a play published, like, done at the public, and then I'll, like, be talking to him and be like, I'm doing edits on Oedipus Al Ray. I'll be like, why? <laughs> it's already public. He's like, no, because it's responsive to the community that you're in. Mm. Um. So, you know, even as we've been in Orange County in Costa Mesa, mm. um, you know, Avaz, it's not like I'm writing the play to this audience at all. But, you know, you do find ways that different, different sort of parts of the play take resonance in, in new ways. Mm -hmm. and, and also the urgency of what's happening in the world mm -hmm. also informs the play. So it's, I think it's always in process, always mm -hmm. in motion. Mm -hmm. We'll stop there and we'll come back to you all. Questions? I'm coming back here. Yes. Go ahead, Zaja. Zaja. Mm -hmm. Question about what happens when you change a play. Do you grieve what you lost? Is it easy? Um, I always ask, uh, playwrights are kind of amazing. Some of you all are like, I cut it because it was trash. I'm like, whew. <laughs> like, dang. I'm like, but you wrote it. They're like, I can write better. I'm like, go ahead, do you. Uh, I could never. Everything I write, I'm like, it's brilliant as it is. <laughs> it can never change. You all are like trash. Uh, but so I'm just curious. Um, you were just in revisions. I just you just opened yeah. a play. There were revisions yeah. constantly. What's yeah. it like? Are you grieving? How do you make cuts? No, How do you I'm, revise? No, I'm ruthless. I to myself. <laughs> I no. Um, no. I I actually I've rarely had a moment where I've had to cut something and it's been sad. I'm like yes, <laughs> goodbye. Like I just like I like in out with the old and with the new. Yeah. Um, I mean. Yeah, I mean, there was a there was a couple days during our process where I was I was there was like a week where I was bringing in like fifteen to forty eight new pages a day, you know. Between Look at Blue's and, face. And, <laughs> um, like, here's, my, here's my here's my new word for today. <laughs> um, no, but also not, not all pages are created equally in that you know like, you, like that might be you have to reprint a page because there's a line or whatever. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I. I really like revision. I really like revision because I don't know. I, I have negative self-talk or something, and I can convince myself that it's better. I don't know. Um, but uh, no, I I I I, I, am, I embrace it, and Great. I've never I've I've never had to go like oh my I I, I always feel like very I, I feel like there's always like a justification and also a confidence I guess also which is like. If I cut this and I think I'm, I realize I'm wrong, it's it's just an older draft. I can go back and find it. You know, it's like mm -hmm. nothing feels permanent in that way. Just like mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. uh, like Luis can change Edifice El Rey, like you know, way, way down the line. Like you can always go back. So yeah. that's which is the, which is nice. You know? Noah, you're vibrating with that. Uh, you know, I had a um, in graduate school the the the, la the last I was a first year. This was a last year student. And he'd come in and he'd give 100 pages and we'd read the thing. And then next week he's like, oh, I did a page one rewrite. And he brought in an entirely different play. And as a first year, I was like, what? there is no way <laughs> that you did it. But what I learned from him, his name was John Alice. And he said he just, he would strip it down. And he would say, okay, if I were to like trash the whole thing, could I start, like what I, what remains from that new draft? Yeah, yeah. And so I had a, I had a draft. And then, yeah, it wasn't working. And then, so I went back and I said, I stripped it down and what remains. And what did remain was father, um, was mother, son. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, let's, let's go back and let's start from mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. thing. And, and Ola and Ilani, who are in my uh, show, they, they know like, um, yeah, if, if, I could be an, uh, if I could do it myself, I would, I would do it myself. But it has to work also for them mm -hmm. and what they are bringing and, and they're the ones performing it. So they're the ones able to tell you like, no, it's not working. 
Yeah. And you can and you can you're able to take a step back and see it because it, if it's in your head, it's working in your head. It's yeah. always working in your head. And then you hear it out loud and it's like, I thought I had it. Great. <laughs> so let's just go back and strip it and start again. Mm-hmm. Cool. Can I always say something? I was like, oh, think of it. <laughs> oh, something that's actually really exciting about cuts um, <laughs> is as a writer, you think that you have to go from like A or you know in your, in your first draft, your writing it's like I have to go from A to B to C. Mm. And then when you realize that you can cut B and then just yes. go from A to C, it's like so exciting yes. because mm. when people talk, we actually talk that way, right? Like we, we jump from subject to subject yeah. thinking that they're unrelated, but they actually are you know, yeah. because mm-hmm. of, of a subconscious link. Yeah. And so when you cut the B and just go from the yeah. idea A to idea C, it's like, wow, wow, that's exciting. You yeah. guys are so like, you must be amazing to work with. <laughs> <laughs> What's your like, process, like, Blue? Down, I'm like, um, notes going. Uh, no, I think like I'm, I I like to think that I'm not super precious, but I know that I'm uh, I'm a little precious. I'm like, hold on, my process. I'm not turning out pages like that. It takes me years <laughs> to like get this thing out. So I'm like, do you know how long I thought about this? <laughs> like so long. Yeah. I'm like, you need to explain to me, like convince me hmm. how this is going to like make the play better and work in the way that I am trying to do. And then I'm like, all right, cool, I'll do it. But I will say the biggest grief I have ever had wasn't about editing. It was why I was writing and I had finished and I had lost the draft and I had a complete meltdown. (laughs) Absolute meltdown. Like literally my partner, I called on him. He's like, what is happening? Is someone dying? I was like, you don't understand. Someone did die. Someone did. (laughs) All my characters. (laughs) They're dead. They're gone. Excellent. I'm going to open up. We got time for maybe one or two more questions. We are going to go five minutes over since we started five minutes late. The next play does start at 10.30. Luckily, it's in a different theater, so we're okay, but we will end uh, shortly. Uh, I saw a hand. Yes, right here. Okay, go ahead. Advice for a new playwright. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I- Surrender. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, I think, so I was not, a, when I started writing, I got so, I, I, I started, I was, I, was, I was an actor before I was a writer, and I took some playwriting classes in college, and I had so much anxiety about sharing work when I first started, that before I would go into class, when, on my days I had to share pages, I would like dry heave in the bathroom beforehand. Mm. I just would get so nervous, like, in, in a way that I never felt nervous about acting, because it was... It felt more of like I'm sharing a piece of me, and that's mm. so terrifying. Um, and I felt that same way having to sit down and look at a blank page. And there was just like a, and I, my my only advice is like, there's like a practice of sitting in discomfort <laughs> when you're writing that I think is really it's just a practice, and like learning how to sit and just move your fingers, <laughs> and like not really judge what comes out for as long as possible is I think a, is a muscle that I think can be worked and it's not fun but I think I mean that that would be my advice or what or what helped me was to get that down I have a writing exercise that ties back to the idea of memory so we can come full circle hey. um, so one of the exercises we did in grad school which I thought was really interesting and fun is our, our teacher had us go um, eavesdrop on, on, a, on, a, on a conversation mm-hmm. like you go to a public place um, and just listen um, to a conversation I mean don't be weird about it or don't be creepy about it but you know <laughs> just like go to a public place and people are talking and you just listen and then um, eventually there'll be a conversation that kind of just like you go oh that's really interesting that's really interesting and then you go home and try to write it and, and like from memory and obviously because you didn't record it because that would be creepy with, our, like, with your cell phone. Yeah. You're, you're actually just working from your memory and um, how you heard that conversation becomes what you write. Um, so playwriting is actually about listening and also kind of like, um, but also your voice, right? So what you heard and how you have reinterpreted it when you try to remember that conversation um, mm. will help you kind of figure out what you're, how you listen to the world. That's so good. 
I, tra- yeah. I transcribed a conversation at a coffee shop across the street like two weeks ago during. Oh, because <laughs> there was a- you transcribed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it was no, yeah. There was a, there was there were two women and one of them was recruiting the other to a multi-level marketing oh, scheme. Oh, oh yeah. 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 nice. And I, just, and I just started. I literally just I I. I, I I completely abandoned what I was working on at the coffee shop yep. and just sat there for <laughs> yep. an hour and a half. It's going to be a good play. As as I could down. Yeah. Nice. I'll just Any other advice? Go ahead. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure. Um, when I said surrender, I was partially joking, but also <laughs> for me, surrender is a big part of it. And um, what I mean by surrender is not giving up. It's I've heard surrender is joining the winning team. And hmm. so hmm. when you're writing and you're facing the blank page, hmm. and, and, and what surrender hmm. means to me in that moment is, if, if, I'm, if I'm in a moment of struggle or anxiety about it, I'm not on the winning team because I'm on team anxiety. Mm. I'm on team fear. I'm on team I don't know what's going to happen with this piece. I'm on team is this going to get picked up, blah, 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 right? That's the team that I, my, that, that we, I can risk being on. Mm. But when I surrender and I say, I don't know what this is meant to be, you know, mm-hmm. universe, whatever you want to call it again, um, just – just sit still, listen, and say, universe, just show me what it's, show me, give me the words. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't know, it doesn't matter for me, like, to, to what I'm asking that question, really. Um, you know, it's just like, I, I just sit still and listen. And I know that it's in me, mm-hmm. but it's not necessarily from me. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's, it's this other thing, you know, it's like channeling, you know, when we, when we talk about a lot of people I've talked about today, like listening to the voices inside your head, it's like, if I surrender my own ideas about what it's supposed to be, I'm a lot more available to what it is already. Cause the play's already been written. That blank page, the play is already there. It's actually already, there's a 90 page document or 120 in some cases, you know, <laughs> but it's like, it's already there. I just have to be in the space of openness to receiving it, kind of. And I, I know, again, that sounds like, it might sound woo-woo, but it's actually not. It's one word at a time. You know, I'm writing it one word at a time. I'm listening to it one word at a time. But it does sort of appear if I, if I open myself to it. Anything blue? Oh, I was like, can I curse? <laughs> yes. Because I was like, uh, honestly, I, I, didn't go for, I didn't go to school for um, writing. I have no formal training in writing, and my, my advice is fuck it. Like, who cares? Just do it. Like, yeah. No, the only thing that's stopping you is yourself and your, like, whatever preconceived notions you have. And because I had none, what's there to stop you? There's, there really isn't anything. So, yeah, just to be like, fuck it. I love <laughs> it. All right, last questions are for me, and they are the lightning round, all right? We're going to walk right down the line, lightning round. Um, what playwright do you think we should know about? What playwright do you think we should know about or a playwright we should revisit? It can be a playwright or a play. We're lightning round. We got three minutes on the clock. A playwright or a play. What do you think these people should go back and read or what do you think these people should seek out? Charlie, are you ready? Yes, I am. Go. Um, they're, they're, re- they're related. Uh, Enid Graham is an incredible <clears throat> playwright. Everybody should be reading her programming her she is a genius my favorite play of hers is a play called pathological venus find it and that play is actually in conversation with who i think should be revisited in american theater right now which is who is uh naomi wallace and um one flea spare slaughter city um just an absolute genius playwright who is actually so prescient for the moment and and she looks at Dynamics between labor and capital. I'm gonna cut you off because it's great. lightning round. Lightning round, right? Michael. This is great. Look her up. Look her up. <laughs> or anybody else, if you got it. Oh, um, my classmate is Amanda Andre, and, and so we made a, a a blood pact where I go, she goes. <laughs> so Amanda Andre, Amanda next Andre. up. All right. Uh, Mia Chang. She, she's the first playwright Aww, that comes to my yeah. to my head. <laughs> there are many, but uh, yeah. yeah, that's the first one. And I, I love it. Yeah, don't say too many. Anybody else? I'm John the blank. No but worries. All, but all black women playwrights. Come on. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's so hard to name one. Um, you know, Luis Alfaro, I named Caitlin Kenny, Bailey Williams, Noel Vinas. I mean, you know, I could go on. Um, Cherry Lucy. You know, I mean, these are people that I went to grad school with. But, you know, like, just like plays that are just so challenging and fabulous and larger than life. I mean... Um, 
And now I'm like, when you name one, then you're like, mm-hmm. oh, now I have to name them all. Mm-hmm. We can but, always, yes. I, I love the naming of the playwrights. Uh, Pacific Playwrights Festival is normally seven playwrights and out of so many, many, but we know that those seven playwrights are very, very special. Their voices are very, very unique for that moment. But we make that decision, right? So there's so many playwrights and so many people out there. Um, and I just always like the a beautiful thing of calling forward the people who inspire us, the people that give us life, that give us breath, that give us memory. Uh, we want to thank you for gathering for this panel. Thank you for being here for the 25th annual PPF uh, festival. Be well. See these folks in the lobby.